Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Chaya Chats. My name is Ruben Thomas. Very happy to be, to be joined by Deacon Rajiv Hatcher. He is currently serving as a reader as part of the St. Gregorio's Orthodox Mission Church in Spokane, Washington. Uh, Shamash, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here, Ruben. Great. It's awesome to have you. You know, it'd be great to be in Spokane with you recording this. But I would love that. Due to uh, the situation that we're all in, we have to do this again remotely. Before we want to get in, we can start with prayer. Sure, yeah. Um, and may God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us in all we do, opening our minds and our hearts to Him and guiding us into doing what is right and beautiful and good according to His wisdom. Amen. So the topic that uh, we that I wanted to talk about today was about relationships, and this is part of a larger, you know, dating and relationship series. But specifically today with you, kind of wanted to go over interfaith relationships, interdenominational relationships, um, and the best way to navigate through them. And I think we all know that a lot of our students uh, in college, and maybe even in high school, a lot of them. Uh, are in relationships, are dating people outside of the Orthodox Church. Um, some people are dating others outside of the Christian faith. I mean, this is a b thing that many of us do, or we know many people who do it, but it's not something that's really addressed. So I kind of wanted to just pick your brain a little bit and sort of just ask, like, off the top, you know, what are some of those struggles that stand out to you from people you know who are in those own, those uh, interfaith relationships um, and even in your own experience, uh, what you've dealt with. Well, it's such a, it's such a big, important question. We're really talking about all life together. And uh, that's why we're here on Earth. Where it's all about life and our choices that we make that affect every relationship. And um, this is the core of our existence is a relationship with God. And so... When we talk about relationship with other people, there's always this comparison of the original relationship, which is God with his creation. So it's such a huge topic that is affected by so many things inside and outside of our own cultures, inside our own faith and outside, and the nuances. And uh, people make a lot of big decisions, sometimes in a hurry, because of the incredible desires that we were actually made to have, but we're also made to choose wisely and, and control these desires. Um, and so there's just, it's such a dynamic topic and a dynamic question, but it, it is so important. So I'm really glad we're, we're talking about it. And it hits really close to home uh, because of my own parents and my own family, my own wife. And, um, there was a lot of non-Orthodox involved. Um, and uh, <laughs> some who became orthodox and et cetera and and what that means so it's it's huge it's a huge topic you know being in college there's already a lot of struggles going on right and then you add on a relationship itself is already going to take a lot of work um, and i think sometimes when you bring in someone who's outside of the faith outside of the culture even right, i think that even adds a little bit more difficulty onto it Right. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of questions that I've heard. I'm sure you've heard about it, too. People who are in those relationships. And I think, you know, just a general question that I've heard is like, is it wrong to be in those types of relationships? Right. Is it wrong, <laughs> wrong. To, to be in a relationship with someone who's not Orthodox or who's not Christian? In terms of having, well, friends who are not Orthodox, of course, God calls us to even love our enemies. So it's not wrong to meet very different people and be friends with them. There, there's, to, on, the, on the first level basis, we know what sins are. If you're committing sins in those relationships, those sins are wrong. Um, but in terms of considering a relationship with someone who's not orthodox, that's not the sin. But where do we go from here is the real question we have. Right. And I guess that leads into my next question. Let's focus on like outside of Christianity first. Is it is it our obligation to try to convert that person to the Orthodox Church? <laughs> so our our job as Orthodox Christians is to keep the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints, right? Jude three. Um, so it's like a light. We were given a we 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 are a candle, 
and this light, where did it come from? It came from a candle that was lit by a candle that was lit all the way by Jesus Christ. So that's our first job, is to literally be light because of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who dwell in us to share that light with others. Now, is it our job to convert people? Well, then we think of, well, God doesn't force anyone to convert, right? He doesn't force anyone. He invites. It's an invitation to his kingdom. It's an invitation to his way of life. Take it or leave it, right? <laughs> right. God, because love is not love unless it's chosen. And so we cannot force people. And now, is it our job to convert? No, it's not our job. But our, our job is to witness to the light and opportunities arise, right? Um, uh, we wouldn't even be Christians if God had not reached out from Judaism, from a specific people to reach out to what we call Gentiles, right? And because he reached out, even God marries the foreigner, right? <laughs> and right. you look at the stories of, um, I mean, from the beginning, it was like, okay, keep to your own, right? From like Abraham <laughs> onward, it was kind of like they still married within their relatives. And then um, this continued, and then you look at Rahab, um, you know, with Joshua, and the Battle of Jericho, etc., and they save Rahab, who's not a Jew, right? And then read that story if you don't know, it's beautiful. Um, and also Ruth, who is not a Jew, but marries a Jew, and then she says, I choose this, even though my husband, my Jewish husband is dead, I choose his God and I choose these things. And those two women become the, the uh, great, the grandmothers, great grandmothers of King David, and inevitably of Jesus Christ himself. So there's a reaching out, right? That's amazing. And, and in Christianity, all the more so there's a reaching out. So I wouldn't say it's a duty that we have to convert people, but I will say this, it's way better to try to expose someone to the faith as a friend than as a romantic interest. If you try to convert someone with your romantic love and how attractive you are, there are <laughs> there are problems. Like, um, in so I've, I've known a lot of my friends in the past, and I had one very short-lived relationship with someone who wasn't orthodox, um, and realized I cannot help her while trying to convert her. I cannot help her to, lead, to, to love and lead the spiritual life and know something about it as a romantic interest. I'm like, I can help her as a friend. And so I distanced myself from that relationship so that I could serve in purity um, the purpose that I felt she needed more. She didn't, she didn't need a boyfriend. <laughs> she, <laughs> right. she needed some other things that I could not offer her. I, I believed I could not offer her as a boyfriend. And I also felt like certain foundational things weren't set. So, so again, there's opportunity, but it's not our job and duty to go and convert people, especially by saying, hey, I'll marry you to convert you, right? Because, again, love is not love unless it's chosen. But. Right. It's kind of like how you approach dating or relationships in general, right? I think a lot of times when, when we're younger and we see someone that we like, we think they're attractive, we think they're cute, we want to talk to them. And we kind of put faith in the background, right? In the back of our yeah. minds. Um, and then once we form a relationship or we begin pursuing it, uh, and then it's after that that we think, oh, wait, there's something here that doesn't, you know, go with each other. And this might be an issue that we struggle with, right? Whether it's on our own level or maybe with our families might have a struggle with this, right? And then at that point, you've already kind of formed that relationship with someone and then you address the faith. Unless you have your sights set on what the priorities are, um, you know, a lot of people just go, okay, I, I guess we'll, uh, we'll just live wherever, we'll see where we end up, and that sounds so romantic and exciting. Oh, and this will be just our story and all this stuff, and it's like, and you're still going to have to make really hard decisions. And, uh, but when we're, when we're young, and I still consider myself young, yeah. <laughs> even though others might really disagree with that. But I, I, I still feel like there are immature things in my heart that I need to grow in. But when we are young, first of all, everybody's good looking, <laughs> right? <laughs> when you're, you were like, oh, yeah, when you're in your 20s, everybody's good looking, right? And just because you marry someone doesn't mean that all of a sudden no one else is good looking. You still got to deal with that, right? How do you look at other people? Um, God made everyone good and there's so many different kinds of beauty but what have you chosen and and so really it's like 
before we, oh man, what did I wake up to and where am I now? You know, it's good to start with the goal in mind. So where am I living? So as Christians, and we can't compartmentalize these things, that's, that's precisely why Christ, <laughs> one of the great reasons why Christ came, to say every area in your life should be filled with light. And Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light of the world. And so if we say, well, here's my faith, but here's my romantic life, right? Here's my family, but here's my dating life. And, and then there becomes that, that embarrassment of like, oh, man, I can't even tell my parents about this. And we're like, hmm, that's interesting, right? Now, there may be really, there may be some seriously troubled parents who can't handle anything beyond what they expected from what they were growing up with, right? And, sure. and with that is to, first of all, be understood rather than say, oh, those, those stupid people from there, those silly people, they're not smart like we are. We're so free over here. Don't they know how enslaved they are to their tradition, et cetera? Like, you have to be able to think, first of all, with respect and honor and go, let's, let's try to understand them. And then let me ask the question, do I actually understand myself, right? Uh, so many of us, we're willing to jump into things actually because our, our culture is a lovesick culture. It's like lovesick puppies everywhere, right? And right. I say this about even myself. I remember being five years old and dreaming about relationships because someone older than me had put this into my head. And right. it, we're exposed to it, it from a very young age. Yeah. I mean, how many, you know, little movies for kids are just totally drenched in romance. And this whole idea of quickly made relationships and just, oh, everything will be better once we're together. And I, I find myself watching movies now that are trying to make some huge romantic point or they pose this, you know, the protagonists, the, the, the man and woman, their relationship, and, and they try to make it out to look so romantic. And I find myself rolling my eyes. I'm like, that's not romantic at all. They're like, oh, I just, I just really want to be with you. I just really need you. I'm like, they don't even know each other. And I know that <laughs> a movie can't <laughs> tell the whole story. But, but we're right. surrounded in this lovesick puppy culture where we really believe that everything we truly desire can be in this exciting, romantic place. I think that's a great point that you said earlier is that it's centered around Christ, right? Everything in your life should be. It's not yeah. just church, your church or your spiritual life is around Christ, and then your family is separate, your school is separate, your work is separate, right? Every aspect yeah. of your life should be centered around Christ, which goes into how you approach relationships. Yeah, yeah. And so, so I was about to say, yeah, getting, getting back to the uh, question of, like, what if you're stuck somewhere and you're like, I don't know where to go from here, right? Um, so that's the first step is, do you really know yourself? Like, and if you're so willing to say, well, even I'm, I'm willing to give up my religion, then maybe you weren't actually educated in your faith. And that might not be your fault. You know, a lot of wonderful Orthodox people don't really teach their kids the faith. A lot of wonderful Orthodox people who do teach their kids the faith, their kids still have free will, Right. They can still choose, and they're still tempted by other things that feel like greater freedom, that feel like they're more fair or just in this world, and it's more of a system of like, well, everybody can be right, and doesn't that sound so fair? And nobody's really wrong, and you're like, then why are you telling me I'm wrong if I believe <laughs> the opposite, exactly. Right? Exactly. So it's a hypocrisy. Do we really know ourselves? We mm -hmm. all have hypocrisy in our hearts. We all have these things that need light to shine upon so we can go, oh man, I need to change something. So if you're already in these relationships and you feel essentially stuck, like I can't fix my family's ideas of what's going on if they even know, <laughs> right? Um, or I can't fix this person, I can't change this person. Well, first of all, you just spoke reality, right? You cannot force other people to believe what you believe. You cannot force them to change. And so, what is easier? To literally say, you, uh, you better hold my hand tight the whole way and you better never let go and stuff like that and I won't ever let you let go. It's like, well, then you don't understand love, right? And if, uh, but which is really easier? The one who just literally reaches out for your hand and says, I trust you and I trust God. 
And the other says, yes, I trust you and I trust God too. And that kind of hand-holding is going to be a very different walk than dragging someone, right? Whether you're trying right. to drag your family down the aisle with you while you drag this to be spouse, right? Right. So, so it's a very difficult decision. But if you're stuck in this situation right now, first of all, if you're not actually married to them, you have no vows with them that are actually a promise. You're not actually bound to them. You haven't made that promise. So if you feel stuck, the good news is you can still get out of that situation. If you're not ready to make that commitment, there's some things that you can do, which is great news. You can get educated by priests that you trust. A lot of people want to seek out information then. They want to understand the faith even more. Because now there's yeah. someone else involved, right? So it's almost yeah. like, I've seen it both ways. People try to figure out each of their respective religions um, to figure out what the difference is. Yeah. I've seen people try to figure out the religions to see what the similarities are and see if they can find a bridge yeah. between the two, which makes it easier for right. them. I like what you said. At the end of the day, you might have to come to a hard decision about yeah. this, about what you're going to choose for your future, for your yeah. life. And there, And the good news is, I mean... Christ is our hope, and Christ is in the Holy Orthodox Church, you know. And so there is hope for your relationship, but again, these things can't be forced. And I also want to point out that, I mean, there are a lot of wonderful, happy endings, right? But there's also a lot of challenges and marriages that break up and children who suffer. And so when we talk about marriage, and there's other podcasts, God willing, um, on on marriage and dating and stuff to come because it's so important for us to understand who we are and what this really means to us. So what, how does God feel about marriage, right? Do we really know what, why we want to be married? You know, and do we really know why that other person really wants to be married or why they want to be married to, to me, whatever it is, to, uh, uh, to whoever is contemplating? And what about the children? Uh, you know, it's like, what about the children? And that's, and that's when, when it really say, gets, yeah, that's yeah, when you yeah. get a lot of questions. Yeah, and um, we can't know everything about the future, but we can do our best to understand now. And if you keep your prayer life constant and you pray every day, God, guide my decisions. He is faithful. He's more faithful than any of us. <clears throat> and he will guide you. Do you believe? Right. I mean. And look at, our, look at our Indian Orthodox Church. A lot of times when people are brought to the church and, and they're not Orthodox, but they're willing to come, right? How, how does our church respond? Does it educate them? Does it have a class for them? Does it say, oh, we'd like you to know the differences and why we must chrismate you or why we must baptize you first? Um, do you know the differences? Do you know the way of life? Do you know why you can't go back once you join. I mean, it's not as enforced, but we're saying, do we actually do anything? I mean, we make our, our priests go through years of training. And people will still say, even after the years of training, they might be like, well, that priest is no good, right? That deacon, that reader, Rajiv Hatcher, he's no good. And yeah, they're just right, okay? They're right about me, or, you know, <laughs> uh, at least about me. Um, and, and so even with a ton of training for our priests, are we training our people to get married? Right. You know? Are we training our people for the celibate life? Are we just kind of going, oh, well, we expect, you know, that one day they'll have grandchildren for me because I have needs, right? <laughs> or, I mean, we'd all love grandchildren. That's the dream. But do we really want what's best for them in God's eyes? And that's a question to ask yourself in this relationship. Do you really want what's best for yourself and this person that you're contemplating marrying in God's eyes? What does God really feel about your relationship? Are you hiding it because you're doing immoral things? Are you hiding it because your faith is so easily mixed with other people's faith? Right. And if it doesn't matter, then what's the whole point? You know, I, um, I, think, I think you're calling them to think about God at an earlier stage than they normally would. Right? A lot of times, like I said, in high school and in college... We're not used to thinking about our actions in relation to yeah. God. Right? And I think this is an opportunity where we can start doing that. It makes us think about it more at a younger age, which is good for us. It's necessary for us. Yeah. 
uh, and um, you know, and that's what something you said reminded me. It's so important that we know what actually Orthodox Christian marriage is about its sacramental nature. And of course, we're going to have those podcasts about it and stuff too, God willing. Um, but also that marriage to us is permanent. And that and you said something about a calling. That's exactly what we say marriage is. It's a calling. It's a calling. The same way that becoming a priest is a calling. The same way that becoming a monk or a nun is a calling. It's, it's like saying, I have called you to be this in this situation. So if you're called to marriage, the call, is, if God is calling you to marriage, he is saying, I want you and your spouse to be priest and priestess of your holy family, which is a mini church. It starts in the relationship phase, too, right? You can't just yeah. go in, you can't just get married and then begin that. I think, like you said, and this is probably this is covered in other podcasts too. But the idea that you know, we should be preparing and practicing for marriage in our relationships yeah. that we have now, yeah. right? That we have in college or That's beyond, right. or whatever. Yeah. And so I even tell our youngest people who might be watching this, the best way that you can actually prepare for marriage is not dating. <laughs> the best way you can prepare is by developing friendships, right? And to really learn how to be honest, how not to gossip, how not to care more about yourself, how to actually learn to listen to another person, how to want what's best for them. If you can pray with your friends, you'll pray with your spouse one day. Mm -hmm. If praying would be awkward for you, something will always be missing unless you make that literal leap of faith mm -hmm. together. Change takes time. Change is hard. We're not talking about Hollywood's version of what they're promoting change as. We're talking about the change to become holy. It's a very specific kind of change, but also mysterious. Uh, and and aside from the, what the church gave me, I feel like really watching my parents' wonderful marriage helped me because I'm like, that's a great marriage. But I was happy. If there was someone I was actually interested in, I, I knew that I wanted them to understand me forever. If we were going to be married, I'd want them to understand me. And I knew that they would never understand me unless they understood my God and his church. And I knew that they could never truly understand my God and his church unless they belonged to it. And right. so, so there would I felt like there would always be this distance between me and my wife if we did not share the same view about truth. Right. And I think yeah. uh, just to change gears here. Um, yeah. And we're, no, we're running out of time here. But <laughs> right. Um, so you know, we've talked about being in a relationship with people outside of the faith, outside of the Orthodox Church. And I think culturally for us as Malayali Christians, right, Orthodox Christians, I think we we have the tendency to stick within our culture. The majority of us do, right? Um, but I think with our when our family uh, gets involved, our families have a tendency to prioritize culture over faith. Um, and we yeah. see a lot of a lot of relationships between different denominations in Christianity, yeah. especially in the Malayali community, relationships between Orthodox and Marthoma and Catholic yeah. and Pentecostal denominations, yeah. right? And I think that's a huge part of our culture. And I'm not saying that it's bad, right? I think any yeah. one of us, myself included, uh, if one of our family members didn't switch over from a church or marry right. into a different faith, right. uh, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here right now. So that's it's right. not, that's it's, right. I'm not saying it's are, bad, right? Are, right. We are thankful for all good blessings, right? Right. And, yeah. you know, the culture, the Malayali culture is such a big part of our family life. It is important to our parents, especially. Yeah. Right. And I just want to say, I think the one issue that we might see is that when it comes time to pursue a relationship or to turn a relationship into a marriage, a lot of times we hear and especially maybe more so from the parents, that what's the difference, right? right. Between Catholic yeah. and Marthoma, between Orthodox and Marthoma, you know, anybody can yeah. switch from one church and, to the other. What's yeah, the difference? Yeah. I, would, I would say if anyone says, what's the difference? Then they just simply are admitting that they don't know. Now, that isn't to insult them, but let's be humble. There's lots of things I don't know, right? Now, there's lots of things that every human doesn't know. 
All right. So the first step we have to, when we really, do we really want the answer? Like when we, when we ask a question, do we want the answer? But I know when people don't want the answer. Right. And so you have to ask, okay, there is a difference. It right. might be difficult for you. Do you want the answer? Now remember this situation of like, like for example, the, the truth kind of situation. Okay, you just have to go to the, the husband's church. Whatever marriage happens, you go to the husband's church, right? This is not a Christian tradition. This is not an Orthodox tradition, for sure. Um, this is a situation in India. It's a standstill, kind of keep the peace sort of thing that developed because of the brokenness in the church. Any group that's not Orthodox or Catholic came from the Protestant Reformation, or their teachers came to, or, or their teachings came to people in Orthodox groups, and then they said, okay, now we're this. But those all originate in one place in Europe um, with the Protestant Reformation. And so, but, the, but the, what I'm really talking about is the brokenness in India, right? And that we're still trying to keep this situation <clears throat> and say, oh, well, we don't want to offend anybody. Well, good luck not even offending yourself in this life, right? We, we hate some of the thoughts that we have, right? So if you live your whole life trying not to offend someone, think of it this way. My duty as a Christian is to speak the truth. People can do with it what they like, and I still have to love them if they disagree with me. But right. just because I love them doesn't mean I have to agree with them. Sure. Now, people are going to make their choices, and it's our job to be patient with them and give them a real reason to look at our way of life. And we'd have to have another podcast on this, and I'm, I'm more than willing to help, to actually understand what it is that, is the, that we call the Orthodox Catholic faith that was from the beginning. What does it mean? Um, because if it's so easy as saying, well, you know, all religions lead to God, we're like, uh, well, yeah, but we're talking about what the result is when they meet God. Are they going to be totally shocked and say, oh, you wanted me to do that with my life? Well, since I've been doing this with my life so long, I really don't feel like changing now, right? And so we don't want to set up ourselves for failure. And so, so it really comes down to, do you, do you know yourself? And do you know what was handed down from Christ through his apostles, through his holy church? And do you know the history of the Martomas? Do you know the history of the Pentecostals? Do you know the history of the Baptists, of the Jesuit missions in India? Do you really know the history? Or are you going, you know, that's too much work. Well, if that's too much work, are you going to marry someone? That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work, right? right? You'll be in for a big surprise. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> right. I think, and this goes back to, to what you said earlier, especially, I think even more so when there's a relationship between it, within the same culture, I think it's important for both sides to research and to learn as much as they can. And I, I like that you mentioned about the quote unquote tradition of people leaving the church just because of marriage. From my own experience, you know, there's many women in my church who have left the church yeah. for uh, because they, they married into the Catholic church, they married into the, the Martha church, right? Yeah. And it is, it's very sad to see them go. There's and that at the same time, of, totally blessed by those who have come to orthodoxy through marriage, too. And some of them are fantastic. I'm not saying some are bad. I'm just saying I'm thinking of some in particular who are just right. fantastic and they're, they're members. They're great. The people yeah. who come, come in through marriage, they're, they're great. I think you, you, you touched on it a little bit. There, there is a double standard here within our yeah. culture, whereas like the women are expected to leave. right? It, and yeah. the parents sort of you know, propagate that understanding of... Yeah. You know, okay, uh, the guy is Martha, when the guy is Catholic, that's yeah. okay. You know, you can go, that's okay, you'll go join their church, but then, you know, when it's the guy's time, right, the guy is expected right. to stay, um, and then whoever they marry come in, and I think a lot of times, girls might not feel the opportunity to even stand up and say, wait right. a second, I want to stay in this church, right? You, that's, that's very super rare. difficult, yeah, um, and it doesn't have to be this way. Um, many decisions that Christians make have nothing to do with the faith, but rather of the, of the peer pressures they feel, like the family pressures that Father Matt, Matthew Alexander talked about in the first Chaya Chats, um, uh, the peer pressures of society. But I want to, you know, probably we should wrap up here, but um, to talk about culture for one second. Okay, so I am half Malayali, right? But I wasn't raised in Kerala. But some things about me, if I just hear Malayalis from 
three blocks away. I'm like, those are my people. <laughs> I'm right. like, I can right. relate to them so much and they can relate to me. And I'm not even fluent in Malayalam. I also know that some things about me are very Irish. Some things about me are very Spokane, Washington, so, and, and an American, right? And some things about me, perhaps someone would say, well, that's just very orthodox. But what I'm really talking about is a whole bunch of cultures that are still reconciled in me. Like, I know that I'm American and Indian and some Irish and orthodox. But the culture that I'm the most interested in, the one that I want to affect me the most, is the culture of the kingdom of God. And that is the culture that is first place. And in my family, if, we, if they were to say, well, what are you guys most? I don't necessarily talk about the Italian food that my wife cooks, which is really good. And it's not the reason I married her, but it was a benefit. <laughs> and the Indian food that I cook, right? The, the, the Malayali food that I cook sometimes, or the Mexican food that my Irish dad ended up teaching me how to cook, right? I mean, there's all this stuff. I talk about our family life. And it sounds more like orthodoxy, I pray, even with my faults, than anything else. So when we're talking about marrying with our, our own culture, my own culture, just because I'm Malankara Indian Orthodox, doesn't mean my own culture is Indian. It means my culture is Orthodox. And if you throw me in a Russian Orthodox church, I will still feel right at home. And if you throw me in an Ethiopian church, I will be right at home. And Arama uh, Armenian church and Syriac and Coptic, when I see Orthodox people, even if I can't understand their language, I recognize them as my own. Now that's the culture that I would encourage people to say, what is your culture? Do you know it? You know? Right. That's beautiful. Like having the culture of the kingdom of God. Because like I said, culture is such a big part of our life, right? And like I've heard, I've heard parents say, that they'd rather have their kids marry Marthoma or Pentecostal than a Coptic Orthodox person. Right, right. which I do not understand. Right, right. Uh, and that again, priority, is, even though I, I love them, but I think that's misprioritized. Right. You know? And again, the message is like, I don't want it to be that, you know, the culture isn't important. Like I said, it's a big part of our lives. Right. And it's a big part of who yeah. we are. Like you said, you you recognize that even if you don't know Malayalam, you know, that's my people right over there. Yeah. Right? And, and you take yeah. joy in that. Right. And so it is yeah. important. But I think where it gets dangerous and is when you start to prioritize that culture over the faith, right, over the kingdom, right, over the truth. And I think that's where I think sometimes you face those difficulties. Yeah, right. yeah. And uh, then the last point I kind of wanted to hit here is I think you brought it up earlier uh, in the in this podcast is approaching this topic with your family, with your parents, um, especially <laughs> if it's somebody outside of the church. Um, I I have I know a friend of mine who uh, he was dating someone who was not who was not Orthodox, who was not Christian. Uh, I believe she was either Muslim or Hindu, right? and he told he told his mom about her, and then. For many days after that, whenever he was around her, she would just be crying the whole time. <laughs> right? like, typical, <laughs> yeah, like, like, that's easy to make a decision in that situation. What you would expect to see in a typical Malayalam movie about like mom <laughs> just sitting there crying. It's true. Yes. It's true. Like you, you go and tell them about, you know, you're dating this Hindu girl, or this Muslim girl, and your mom's just sitting there crying. And your dad's like w wondering what's going on. Right. Um, so I think this is a tough one. As you said before, a lot of our college students, uh, even in high school, I mean, this this is happening in high school, too. A lot of them do not tell their parents. Right? They hide yeah. it from them. But how, how do you go about approaching your parents so, with the subject? Well, before the parents, first of all, are you hiding from yourself? Are you brushing? Are you trying to sweep this under the rug? Right. You're like, well, uh, it'll just be fine later. Right. And so, first of all, are you hiding from yourself, your own conscience, right? Second of all, are you hiding from God? Are you actually praying about this? Lord, help me to be yours. Help, if it be your will that I could make this person happy and blessed, and we could raise a family to your glory, where's that prayer? I mean, I prayed this for my life, but if you do not think that this would be the best thing for your will, let it not happen. Are you willing to let that go? So are you hiding from yourself? Are you hiding from God? Are you hiding from your person that you're intending to marry? Are you, in, are you hiding your intentions that you just one day think, I will convert them. Ah, they'll figure it out. Or later, 
where you're like, well, I guess we'll just figure out what happens. Well, there are some things that you can't figure out now. But set yourself up with success and make a plan now. And then, are you hiding from your priest? Your spiritual father was given to you, designed by the Holy Spirit, revealed in the church, to help you make these decisions. So are you, are you hiding, right, from all these? And then, are you hiding from your parents, you know? If you are hiding from your parents, there are some legitimate reasons why. Some families can't handle this conversation, right? They weren't trained about how to handle it. They're not used to seeing people convert by choice other than marriage, right? right. Um, um, in many of our churches. Now, we've got more and more coming, right? And it's not just Spokane, but there's other now um, mission churches around um, in our diocese, and God knows a lot of the other Orthodox churches, the, the, the Greeks, the Coptics, the Russians, Antiochians, have brought in converts for a long time now. Um, and we typically haven't um, for a while, and we're getting on our, our feet now. Um, so, so there are good reasons why sometimes you might feel really afraid to tell. But get rid of all the bad reasons. <laughs> get rid of the bad reasons first, and then see if there's any really good reason to hide this information. I would usually doubt that it sim simply would always need to be hid. I, mean, I, can, I, I, I can imagine a few, you know, dramas where there's, you know, like <laughs> some family who has a hit list or something or a mafia connection. Okay, maybe, you know, West Side Story, I don't know. Um, but <laughs> but I, 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 would encourage, I would encourage everyone to think of those. Am I hiding from myself? Am I hiding from God? Am I hiding from this person who I am talk and dating, right, dishonestly or honestly intending for marriage? And then am I hiding from my priest, am I hide my spiritual father, and then am I hiding from my family? And get to know your heart through this process. And talk, 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 is what my dad told me to do with my, uh, my wife when we were engaged. And before we were engaged, we still talked about marriage and said, we're talking about getting engaged, you know? And there are always fears because they worry for us. And Malayalis were generally anxious people, right? We get nervous about everything. We find things to worry about. But remember, Christ said, do not be anxious, right? So pray, pray, pray. I, I'm glad you brought up the point of having a spiritual father that you can talk to. I think a lot of times, maybe our young people will be a little, feel a little bit more comfortable talking to their spiritual father about this. You know, please reach out to them. You know, dealing with your family is very tough in these types of situations, true, right? So as long as, as you said, having that communication between yourselves, right, between you and God, between you and your spiritual father, and then help, hopefully between you and your family, right? It only yeah. helps things get better. Yeah, I mean. So I think that's a good place to end it. Shemashin, right, awesome. We may have gone a little long over time, but that's okay. It's an important oh, topic, yeah. right? Thank and it's, God. this is part of a bigger series that we're trying to, God willing, publish. Um, so I think this is very important for a lot of us, right? If we ourselves did not go through, we at least know someone close to us who is in an interfaith relationship or interdenominational relationship. Yeah. Um, so I'm very thankful for you for taking this time to speak with us today. Oh, thank um, you so much for all your work and leadership on this. Thank God. Thank God. And thank you for everyone listening. Um, I highly encourage anyone, if you're ever in the state of Washington, please check out the St. Gregorius Orthodox Church in Spokane. Um, it is a wonderful parish. I hope you all continue to stay safe, and please stay tuned for the next episode of Chaya Chats. Thank you. God bless you all. Pray for me. <laughs>